Good morning to you. Welcome to a few minutes of devotional time here at the Little Studio. I'm your friend, David, and I hope to share some scripture and thoughts uh, about our Savior with you this morning. Uh, you may be just getting ready to go to church, uh, a church of your choice, uh, or you may have just gotten up and need something to brighten and encourage your day as you start up. So uh, Ann and I are hoping that uh, we get that uh, to go down the line to you. Wherever you are, whatever time you're watching, Miss Ann and I are so glad that you came by to see us. And we hope that uh, when you leave here this morning that you feel better uh, than you did when you came. I've got a little hack going on, so if I cough a little on you, uh, you're still safe because you're you're out there in uh, in uh, online land. <laughs> you know, the Bible says Jesus came so that we can have life and to have that life more abundantly, and that includes the short time that we're here on Earth, and also more importantly, the eternity after we leave here, uh, which we can enjoy with the Lord that made us. So. Trust me, I know of no other place that I wish to spend eternity other than in the presence of God who loves us so much, and I hope you feel the same way. Also, let me uh, invite you to be with us at our home church this morning, as we do every week, Arbor Grove United Methodist Church. It will be on the Facebook page of the same title this morning at 11 o'clock for our regular uh, worship service on Sunday. Uh, Pastor Susie says she's coming today armed with scripture from Mark chapter 1. And she's going to be preaching from verses 40 through 45 in Mark chapter 1. And uh, Lois will be a play in the piano for our hymn singing. Cousin Eric, Susie, and me will be singing about the blood of Jesus if it goes like it's supposed to go. And it just won't be complete without you being there. So tune us in at 11 o'clock on Facebook, if you will. <clears throat> you know, uh, I used to love sitting on the front porch uh, of my grandpa Bill Johnson's house late in the evening after work when supper was over because Pa, as we called him, uh, would come out and park in his old wooden rocking chair and watch the sun go down. Uh, and almost every evening, either neighbors or kin folks would come by and set a spell, as we used to say, and uh, Pa would tell stories about everything that had happened to him in the past. Now, sometimes the stories were common events, but when it came to the size of a fish that he had caught or a deer that got away from him or some of them hunting stories, sometimes them stories could get a little bit bigger with each telling, and we all loved every minute of it, and we loved him. I remember reading a story about a grandfather that was telling his little grand uh, a tall tale one time, which explains to me the laws of physics. It goes like this. He told the kids that he was bear hunting one time, and he dropped his gun, and he said that big old bear started running toward him, and he started running away from him, and finally that bear got so close he said he could feel that bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. And the kids' eyes got real big, and they all kind of hollered out and said, Well, what did you do, Grandpappy? And he said, Well, there wasn't nothing to it. I just put him in reverse. And they all yelled out, Well, how would you do that? He said, Well, I just turned around, and I reached right in that old bear's mouth, and I reached all the way through that old bear as far as I could till I caught the inside of his tail from the inside, and I yanked real hard. And youngins, that old bear turned wrong side out, and he run the other way. <laughs> now I guess that's reverse grandpa style and it's just a tall tale but I'll tell you as truthfully as I know it when God calls you to repentance and you respond the reverse gear in your life is just about as profound as that old bear was in grandpa's story except this time it'll be for real and it only takes a look at scripture to see this reversal in many folks lives during Bible times way back there so quickly let me remind you about three of those people the first one is Peter he was a brother to Andrew if you remember the names of the disciples and both of them were early followers of John the Baptist 
who came just before Jesus with the message of repentance to God for sins. Now sometime later, Peter and Andrew would be called by Jesus to follow him, which they did. We, we know that. According to scripture, Peter was a fisherman. And that wasn't an easy job in those days. And also, if you read about him in any of the four Gospels, uh, you will find that Peter had a tendency, like a lot of us, to speak first and then maybe do a little thinking afterwards. <laughs> he often seemed to misunderstand the point that Jesus was making in his dealings with the people when they ministered. But from the point that Jesus calls him all the way through the three years of Jesus' earthly ministry, Peter was there. And all the time, God was molding him and shaping not only his mind, but most of all, his heart. And just when you think it was all for nothing, when Peter denies even knowing Jesus there at the end of those three years when Jesus was on trial and about to be crucified, Peter denied that he knew him. Uh, he was scared. And it's not very long after that that you see Peter in total reversal, standing up at the Feast of Pentecost and preaching the first public sermon about Jesus and what he means to the world. This was that same Peter. He continued this ministry until he was crucified many years later in Rome. Now that's a pretty big change from a opinionated old blowhard of a fisherman with a cowardly streak, ain't it? For all he was or was not, it was Peter that said in Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was talking about Jesus. He recognized him for who he was. How many people still today live their whole life and never come to this realization? Hmm? The second person to remember is Mary Magdalene. You know, according to Mark chapter 16, verse 9, not only did Jesus cure her from a demon possession, she was the first one to carry the word of a risen Savior to the disciples after Jesus was crucified and buried because they were hiding. They were scared. Verses 9 through 11 in Mark 16 read like this. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene out of whom he had cast seven devils. She was in bad shape when he met up with her. And she went and told them that had been with him, that was the disciples, as they mourned and wept, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. The Bible says they, they wouldn't even believe it to begin with. But she was the first one of that uh, carrying that message. Now, I'm not trying to read anything into Scripture that's not already there. But by the definition of the word evangelist, the carrier of the good news, the word of Jesus Christ, she seems to me to be the first evangelist carrying word of a risen Savior to those who had forgotten that he said he would rise again. And even if, if they ever really believed that he would in the first place. That's pretty much an about face for a woman possessed of seven devils. I think you'd have to agree. But scripture says that's what the Lord did for her. And you can go read it for yourself and read about her reaction to her life change. She wound up following along with Christ's followers and taking of her own wealth and money, of which apparently she had plenty, and helping support his ministry. You know, they, they had to eat, they had to travel, and she helped do that. And the last one we're going to think about today is Paul, who was first called Saul. Here was a well-educated man. He was part Jewish. He was Pharisee, uh, which meant he carried weight with the religious ruling class. And yet he was also a Roman citizen. So he seemed to have a foot in both camps during his early life. He was an important fellow. And he was always full of argument for whatever he believed in. The problem was that he first believed that these new followers of Jesus were the enemies of both his Jewish nation and even the empire of Rome. So he set out to kill 
or imprison them all. But you know the story. On the road to Damascus, the Lord stops him in his tracks. He knocks him down. He blinds him for a little while and explains what he wants Paul to do, that he wants him to be the carrier of the gospel, and in particular to the Gentiles. And for most of us in our culture, in our country today, that would include our ancestors and include us. And that was the exact opposite of persecution, which Paul was wanting to do. Paul then spent the rest of his life, many years, telling people about Jesus and making the argument for following him. In the end, he paid for his evangelism with his life, like most of the disciples did, and became probably the most quoted and remembered evangelist and biblical writer in history. Now, other than history, what does this mean to you and me? Well, I'll tell you what it means to me. We all know folks like these three that we just talked about that are living around us today. And I know people like Peter that are, are driven by their jobs and their worldly life, and some of them love to talk first and think second. As a matter of fact, uh, I've been guilty of all that. We also know people like Paul that are possessed with a quick mind, a brilliant argument, and a fine education and public prestige. But they're using all of these resources for all the wrong reasons, and they ain't doing anybody any good. Most of all, themselves. Have you ever been guilty of that? I have. And I don't think I have to remind you that devils and demons can still possess people like they possessed Mary Magdalene. And sometimes they seem to drive them some, to some horrible, terrible habits and actions. And most importantly, I hope and pray that you and me don't fall victim to the lifestyles of what these three started out to be in their lives. But even if we have, even if we do, God changed them. And the same God can change us for the better by putting us in reverse just the way that old hunter did with that bear in the story. You see, sometimes if we have never really met the Lord in a saving way, or if we have, but we've grown apart from him and gotten cold in our faith, you know, that can happen. And when it does, he has a way of shaking our tree. He might let life get pretty uncomfortable for us sometimes when we go off away from his direction like a stray sheep or a stray dog or something. He might even reach way down inside of us like that old hunter did and jerk us to our senses. But now he won't force us to obey him. We have to do that for ourselves. He'll help us, but he's not going to force us to be his children. But he sure gives us every opportunity to come back to him if we stray. He puts up with us a whole lot more than we would put up with each other or anybody. And scripture says in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 8, it says this, But now, O Lord, thou art our father, and we are the clay, and thou our potter, like a potter making a vase, and we are all the work of thy hand. That's how he wants us to look at him. Let him do the shaping. Let him do the, the work on us. If we believe him, if we accept his hand on our lives, then he molds us into what he wants us to be. And by following him and his commandments, we do ourselves good and all those around us. We're going to want to help those around us. Jesus came and died for us so that we would know just how much God loves us. And it's only through faith in Jesus Christ that we can live our eternal lives with him. So make sure that whatever direction we're going, it's the right direction. It's God's direction. Amen. I thank so many of you, for, but I had a little birthday this week and got just a little bit older. 
And some folks say, well, how old are you, Dave? Well, I'm 68 years old. I'd say 68 years young, but I just ain't that big a liar. So uh, anyway, uh, I love every one of you. For those that called uh, through Miss Annie's Facebook, I, I don't, I, I can't deal with Facebook. I've got too many things going on with computers and telephones, but she's my contact with the outside world. So uh, thank every one of you. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to sing you a little song here. If I had Brother Rex Taylor over here with me, we'd both sing you a song. He's always singing you some pretty songs on the, on the internet. I love Rex. We, we went to school together, and I, I hope he's doing well. Here's just a couple of verses of a song that talks about staying in God's direction. It goes like this. Have a good Sunday morning. I hope to see you over to Old Arbor. And if not, I hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. I love you. God bless.